hello. A couple of announcements for us to be aware of. One, this is the time of year when schools are wrapping up. And so the church here would like to help you celebrate in some important educational milestones. So if you have someone in your family that you would like to share out uh, their information with us as far as whether they are transitioning to the next level in their educational progress and path, let us know so that we can be happy and celebrate with you. For example, we're talking the little ones that are going from fifth grade elementary to sixth grade middle school type of setup. Maybe we've got a middle school junior high student getting ready for high school, transitioning. Those high school graduates are now maybe moving on to a technical school or into college. And then finally, maybe we have some people who have earned higher degrees that we want to know about. So just reach out to the office, let us know, so again, we can be a part of that celebration with you. A couple of technology updates now and some information. One, we are getting ready to shift into a go live permanently. Miss Amanda, our wonderful secretary, has been working hard on that, getting the technology all rigged up, and she's been kind of piloting that for us. And now we're getting ready to uh, have that available as a permanent feature here at the church. Now the technology part might be above some of our heads, but pushing a button or two should be easy for a lot of us to handle. So next Sunday, May 23rd, immediately following church, there will be a light lunch opportunity uh, for the lunch provided and then an opportunity for you to learn what might be involved in helping out with some of the technology positions that are now needed and opened up to help keeping our services, whether in person or virtually, running smoothly and available to all. So if God puts that on your heart and you just want to come kind of check it out, it'll be pain-free, very short and sweet with a light lunch provided, again, following church next Sunday. Another serving opportunity in the realm of technology is for hosting the online live sessions. So what that means, and I had to ask, is currently now Amanda is doing that as she's seated in here in the auditorium, but what she does is she just is welcoming the people who are watching online, or she's posing questions or thoughts that they might want to think about just to, inter to, to get them to interact with each other online. And that's just such an important role. So if you uh, think that that might be something that you could lend a help to, please again let the church office know. And I'll give you that email here in just a second. Um, but that is such an important role that um, you can be serving even though you're not physically here at the church. Just someone to sort of be the ringleader and keep conversation going with people who are doing an online opportunity. The email for any and all of that that was mentioned is hello at hurricanecommunity.church. Hello at hurricanecommunity.church. So thank you for being willing to serve. Would you now bow your heads for a moment of prayer with me, please? Dearest, most loving Heavenly Father, I come to you today just asking that you put service on our hearts and our minds. There are many positions here, many roles that need to be filled. And Lord, I just ask that you help all of us to think about the role that we can play in plugging into some of those opportunities whether it's with a physical presence opportunity on a service Sunday, whether it's a planning opportunity, whether it's a phone call or a card that you can send and make. Lord, I just ask that you not let us fall into some of those excuses and traps for serving. I've put in my time, or I don't have enough time or I wouldn't be as good as someone else. Lord, don't let us use those excuses as reasons not to serve. And Lord, thank you for not using those excuses in your service to us. Where would we be if you were too tired or if you didn't want to take the time? So Lord, thank you. Let us have a servant's heart as you show us with your mighty love and grace daily. 
Lord, it's these things that we ask in your name. Amen.
It's not necessarily that we fear we will miss out on something, but maybe the truth of the matter with FOMO, or fear of missing out, is that something else is in reality missing us. What have you missed during this time of quarantine? Sitting at home, we may have thought we were missing out on lots of things going on, but the main thing we miss out on is other people relationships. What is it that you have missed during this quarantine time? I don't know about you, but I have missed you, my friends and my worship family. Relationship with others is key to our making sure we continue to connect and be together. That is the something that is missing. Thank you for choosing to spend this time with the online campus of Hurricane Community Church. Whether this is your first time, first time in a long time, long time attendee, whatever your status is, relationship to that, we're so glad that you've chosen to spend this time with us. And we hope that this time helps you take a step in your relationship with God and following Jesus. When I was a, a teenager, I was very much of an extrovert. We moved twice during my childhood, and according to my parents, it didn't take long before I knew everyone on the street, and everyone on the street knew me, in a good way. In my 20s and 30s, I had to pretty much stay busy all of the time, doing something with my friends, or being out and about in some way. As I got into my late 30s, things began to shift a little bit. And I started becoming much more introverted and much more with the desire to stay at home more than being out running around. Now, our family schedule has a tendency during different seasons to ramp up pretty significantly. And when our schedule ramps up, there are times where we feel like we're going in multiple directions all at the same time. And there are times when we feel like we have just walked in the door and have to turn around and walk right back out the door to go somewhere else. Or times when we didn't even get to walk in the door at all until late in the evening or late into the night when everything's done and over. Well, when these seasons hit, I can get to the point where sometimes all I want to do is to have a little bit of time at home, in the quiet, 
with no demands and no expectations placed on me at all. And sometimes I can even get to the point where I begin to feel as though it would be perfectly fine if I never had to go anywhere or do anything and could just stay home and be at home um, with no regards for anything else. But there's an interesting dynamic when these seasons hit and those feelings of wanting to just be at home come. And the interesting dynamic is that even when I feel like that, there's a part of me that still wants to be with people. And the reason there's a part of me that still, still wants to be with people is because there is an innate desire in each and every one of us to be connected in relationships. For some purposes, Zoom and Google Meets are okay, but most of us tend to miss our family gatherings, our family Christmas, our family Thanksgiving. There is a part of us that just wants to be together, right? When the pandemic caused the church to suspend in-person services twice in 2020, there were some people who missed the church. And there were some people who got used to church online. And there were some people who got used to life without the church altogether. And there are some people who the shutdown or the suspension of in-person services for the church didn't affect anything at all because they didn't really give the church any consideration to start with and had no knowledge that the church was suspending in-person services because it wasn't a part of their life anyway. This takes me to a question that I've run across multiple times in several different church leadership resources. And the question that is asked is, if your church was to close its doors tomorrow, would anyone miss it? This is a very challenging question. And this is a very compelling question as to what the church is and is supposed to be about. You see, we oftentimes think of the church as a building or a place where we, where we go. And when we understand the church as a building or we understand the church as a place that we go, we misunderstand God's design and intention for the church. The church should be a place and the church should be a people that has such an impact on the community around it that the answer to the question, would the church be missed if it closed its doors tomorrow, should be an adamant and unequivocal yes. The first time that the word church is used in the New Testament part of the Bible, it's used by Jesus as he's traveling around the region, connecting with people and teaching about the kingdom of God. And he's with his followers when he uses this word church for the first time. As they approached uh, an area called Caesarea Philippi, which is in the northern part of Israel, Jesus leads up to the use of the word church, <coughs> excuse me, for the first time, and starts the conversation with a question. He turns to his followers and he says, Who do people say that the Son of Man is? Now the Son of Man is a reference to Jesus. So he's basically asking his followers, Who, who, who do people say that I am? As he had traveled the region and he had been healing people and been doing some pretty cool stuff and teaching a countercultural message and irritating the Jewish religious leaders, certainly his reputation had spread throughout the region and people were talking about their impressions and their perceptions about who they thought Jesus might be. Well, his followers respond. They all kind of start chiming into the question with what they're hearing people say about who Jesus is. And they say, well, some say John the Baptist. Some say Elijah. And others say Jeremiah or one of the other prophets. 
By the time Jesus asked this question, most of the Jewish religious leaders agreed that the time of the prophets, which was a period in Israel's history, had come to an end. But there were still a significant number of Jewish people who were waiting for a prophet who would announce the coming of the long-awaited Messiah, the one they believed would be sent by God to redeem Israel and restore Israel as a nation. All of the answers that Jesus' followers give to him about his question, uh, in response to his question about who people say that he is, fall into the category of the prophets. John the Baptist was a contemporary prophet of Jesus that was, was around at the same time Jesus was. And he talked about repentance. And he talked about the kingdom of God. And he, he communicated a very similar message to Jesus. And John the Baptist had been beheaded by Herod in response to some conflict and tensions that he had encountered with Herod. And some believed that the message of Jesus was so similar to John the Baptist that Jesus may very well be John the Baptist brought back to them in some way. Elijah was a prophet from a previous generation of Israel's history. And Elijah, um, much of what Elijah did would have compared to what Jesus did. And it was believed that Elijah would be brought back to the nation of Israel in a physical bodily form. And so some people believed that because Jesus did similar things to what Elijah did, that perhaps this was Elijah being back. Jeremiah was another prophet from a previous generation. And he was known as the weeping prophet for how the condition of the nation of Israel's relationship with God broke his heart. And it would have been similar to how the condition of the broken world broke Jesus' heart. And so some people believed that maybe this was Jeremiah, or maybe he was one, <coughs> excuse me, of the other prophets from Israel's history. But G Jesus wanted to know what the people were saying about him. And the interesting twist is he didn't ask the question because he didn't know what was being said. He asked the question because he wants to take his followers on a journey to understand more about who he is and more about the kingdom that he came to establish, which they were in the process of developing and gaining an understanding of. So, Jesus wants to know more than the public opinion and he wants to take them on a journey and he wants to dig and make this a little more personal. So he asks them a follow-up question. He says to them, but who do you say <coughs> that I am? It's one thing to know what the general consensus about Jesus is, but it's another thing to know what we believe about Jesus personally. This question that Jesus asked isn't a question that he had ever asked before. The public perception of him would have been likely gained from a distance as people viewed and watched what Jesus did from afar, gathered in crowds and things like that. But the people that Jesus asked this question to, his closest followers, some of them had been with them from the very beginning. They had seen People healed. They had heard the countercultural message about God's kingdom. They had heard and seen the confrontations with the Jewish religious leaders over that message. They, they had had the opportunity to sit in a small circle and ask Jesus questions about what he meant when he taught certain things. They had sat around the campfire and they had sat around the dinner table with Jesus. And Jesus makes this conversation and this interaction very personal to those closest to him to say, what do you believe? Who do you say that I am? Well, all of the people, all of his followers had chimed in to the first question about what others were saying. But this second question gets only one response. 
And here's the response. You are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. Though all had chimed into the previous, this response comes from Peter. And scholars are divided about whether Peter is speaking just for himself or speaking for the group as a whole. But what Peter communicates is that they believe, or at least he believes, that Jesus is the Messiah, the one that God promised to send to establish his kingdom, and that he is the son of the living God. And there is a stark contrast between the gods of the culture and God as the living God. The Greco-Roman culture was full of all sorts of gods, lifeless gods, that had been established and built from bricks and stones and wood and things like that. But when Peter declares God to be the living God, he declares something different. He, he declares that God cannot be rivaled by any form of lifeless God that we may try to put in his place. <clears throat> well, Jesus commends Peter for his answer. And then he turns and he he uses the word church for the first time when he says, Upon this rock I will build my church, and all the powers of hell will not conquer it. Both of these statements of Jesus are emphatic. They will happen. He will build his church, and he's taking responsibility for building his church. And, and the gates of hell, the, the, the word in this translation is powers, but there's also another translation that uses the word gates. Most ancient cities were surrounded by a fortress wall, and somewhere in the wall there was a gate, maybe a door, if you will. And it was not uncommon for uh, court to be held at the city gate. It, it was not uncommon for people to debate philosophy of the day at the gates to the city. And Jesus says that the gate of hell will not prevail against the church. There is nothing that will stand in the way of the church when the church is functioning as Jesus intends for it to function. And he takes responsibility for building the church. The word in the Greek language that's used for church is the word ekklesia. <clears throat> and it comes from two words together, ek, which means out of, and klesia, which comes from the root word called. The word ekklesia means simultaneously to gather, to assemble, and to be called out. So a more literal translation of the word ecclesia, of the word church, is a called out assembly or gathering. And Jesus uses this word emphatically that he will build a called out assembly or gathering. When we think that the church is a place we go, or a building that we pass by as we drive down the road. We misunderstand God's intention and design of a called out assembly or gathering. Jesus came to establish his church. And the church that he came to establish would be a church, a place, and a people for Jews and Gentiles. It, it, it would be a place and a people where anyone and everyone can be redeemed from sin and restored into right relationship with God. It would be a place and a people where everyone can connect in God-honoring, healthy relationships with one another. <clears throat> The church will be a people and a place that is missed when people are figuring out what's missing 
in life. God's intention and design for the church is to be a place, but more so to be a people. A, a called out assembly or gathering. A collection of people who are connected in right relationship with God through what Jesus did for us that we could never do for ourselves. That then is called out into the community around, into the world. A world that is broken by sin. A world that is in desperate need of hope. A world that is in desperate need of of redemption and the church should be a place and a people where a broken hopeless desperate world can find hope and redemption in right relationship with God and connected in God honoring healthy relationships with one another people are isolated and people are lonely and people are desperate and the church should be a place and a people where relationships can be found and people can connect in relationship with one another and discover how to make what's wrong in the world and in our lives right in relationship with God and following Jesus. <clears throat> As we begin to wrap up, let me suggest three practical steps that can kind of help us not miss the church and maybe have the church not miss us. The first step is to engage. Don't settle for just attending or watching online. Don't, don't settle for just taking in information Engage with the information in such a way for application. Don't just engage with information and not discover how that information makes a difference in your life. Don't, don't, don't just take in information about who God is and not take the step of engaging with that information in a way to implement how relationship with God can make a difference in your life. Engage, in, if you watch online, engage in the chat section. Respond, interact, ask questions, make comments, make positive comments, hopefully. It, 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 in, engage with the next step guides that are provided. A, a, a set of questions that, that you can use to take the next step with the content of the, the, the message. And, and you can take that step as an individual or with a friend or with a coworker, or as a family or as a small group. But engage in some way. And we, as a church, are going to continue to intentionally work on ways that people can engage with who we are and what we do. The second step is to connect don't don't settle for just attending. Um, don't 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 settle for just if you attend on site to to physically walk in and then walk out and don't ever uh, connect with anybody about anything. Um, if if you watch online, um, don't don't just log in and log back out, but find some form some step of connection because there is an innate desire in each and every one of us to be connected and life is better when we are connected in relationship with God and in God honoring relationships so find a connection point maybe it's serving in a ministry maybe it's serving in family ministry in some way or serving in first impressions ministry or maybe it's starting a new small group where people can gather through the week here at the church or in a home and take the next step in their relationship with God and one another find some kind of connection point and connect and we are going to continue to intentionally work on creating connection points that are effective for taking those steps. 
the third step is to invite. Invite someone to engage and connect with you. Invite someone to dinner. Invite someone to attend church with you and then go out to lunch. Invite someone to come to your home to participate in a small group. Invite someone to come to your home to just connect relationally. People are lonely. People are isolated. And we may never know the difference that an invitation can make in someone's life. And, and th this invite thing isn't about just inviting random people, though, though sometimes that's appropriate and maybe sometimes effective. This is about investing in the life of someone to connect in relationship with them, to invite them into the journey of discovering who God is and what life with God is about. It's about inviting them to discover what it means to follow Jesus. Because, because life is better when we are connected. And the church should be a place and a people where connections are made that make life better and make us better at life. The church should be a people and a place where connections are made in right relationship with God and following Jesus. The church should be a people and a place where connections are made in relationships with one another that breathe life into us. And I don't know about you, but that's the kind of church I want to be a part of. And even more so, that's the kind of church that God came to establish in Jesus. And that's the reason Jesus came, to establish a church, to be a place and a people where others would be invited into a growing relationship with Jesus Christ. And when we as a church, individually and collectively, align with God's intentions and design for the church, we will never need fear missing out on anything. Maybe, maybe what's missing in your life is the church. And maybe, just maybe, as much as it's missing in your life, the church is missing you. Let me pray as we wrap up this time together. Dear God, thank you for the church. Thank you for this called out gathering or assembly. A place where people can connect in relationship with you and in relationship with one another and discover what it means to follow Jesus. God, help us individually and collectively to be that kind of church. To not fall into the trap of the church just being a place where people go or a building people drive by but that we as a church are indeed a people who are doing and becoming what you desire for us to do and become. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, thanks again for connecting with the online campus of Hurricane Community Church. Hope that you'll connect with us again the next time and that this time helped you take a step in relationship with God and following Jesus and becoming the church that God intends. Have a great rest of the week. Some things in life are very personal. Our opinions, our mistakes, our thoughts, or our past. We may keep those to ourselves, or we may share them with a select group of friends, or maybe not share them at all, until we are asked. There may have been a time when you were asked about your beliefs or even about the Bible. It's all very personal.